Hello, everyone. Welcome here to the Saturday keynote for the West Virginia Game Developers Expo, as well as the West Virginia Cybersecurity Expo. Uh, I am Patrick Smith, and I first want to thank our two main sponsors, uh, Remake West Virginia, who is an epic mega games recipient, as well as Mount West Community Nintendo College. Uh, today, we have a wonderful session here with two industry experts, Brad Kalinowski, who is the head of the studio Fuse FX, and Brian Goodrich. And they're going to show us all kinds of, um, well, of ways that you can use Unreal in Hollywood at this point. And also, you can do mocap and things like that. So, gentlemen, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you all to show what you want. I'll gladly drive and, and show footage for you, Brian. You just let me know when and where, and, and I'll... I'll step out of the way and let you all take over. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Um, sorry, I had to step away for a minute and came back, so now I'm kind of thrown off. Um, how many people do we have in here? How do we know, Patrick? So currently live streaming, because we just started back up, we have uh, five people <clears throat> that we know of for live. We've got uh, one on Twitch, and we have four out there on, on YouTube. And so that number can fluctuate as we go through here. They're going to be able to send us comments as well. And we're going to be able to aggregate those and see them. And so uh, myself or Corey or David Dunphy, depending on who's on at that time, as we're juggling different sessions here, yeah, yeah, can, yeah. can throw questions to you and, and you all can field those. Okay. All right. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm Brad Kalinowski. I'm originally from Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, and... Uh, about 25 years ago, went out to Los Angeles to start this whole career that I'm in, been in for 25 years, um, almost 26 now. Uh, you know, knowing that there's not many opportunities in in, uh, in West Virginia, I hope that I can, um, you know, me and my buddy Brian uh, can uh, help, uh, you know, help you, uh, you know, shed some light or, or shed some light on on the direction you, you could probably go and what you can do and even even help you with some of your games that you're involved in, in development and that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, uh, I went out to the Hollywood and uh, 25 years ago, uh, started in the re uh, facial motion capture uh, research and development um, at a company called Life Effects Pacific Tidal Mirage. And, um, and, uh, you know, that really was the, the big start to my career. I mean, it was kind of difficult, um, you know, going out from, you know, coming from West Virginia uh, and then hit, you know, uh, West Virginia where Huntington, where there's probably 50, 55,000 people live. And then you go to a big city where there's uh, 10 million, a million within a block, basically, almost seems like sometimes. Um, and uh, so anyway, but, you know, went out, took a chance and uh, and things uh, pretty much uh really worked out, you know, as I started in the industry and started out in facial motion capture, uh, we were doing a uh, facial motion capture R and D for, uh, the, uh, remake that, that never got done because it was just too expensive at the time, but it was called the, the incredible Mr. Limpet. Um, the facial motion capture that, that I helped, uh, develop went on to be used in Spider-Man, uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, and uh, even a little bit of the white papers went to ILM so they could develop their facial motion capture for Star Wars for like Jar Jar Binks and that kind of thing. Um, Jar Jar Binks, you know, what a waste. Uh, so, so um, yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that's where we met, Brad, right? At, at, oh, uh, yeah. At Pack, at Pack Title. Um, yeah. Me and Brian... Yeah, me and Brian worked at at the company. It, it was Life Effects Mirage Pack Title. Then it went, you know, when the dot com boom back in the nineties or two thousand, early two thousands, imploded. Then me and uh, I went to work as a uh, roto paint compositing artist over at Pack Title, and uh, Brian uh, actually was working downstairs in the three D department. Yeah, we, uh, and we had a small three D department at the time, and uh, yeah. And, and we, we, that's that's where we met and uh, were able to to work on quite a few films together. Uh, yeah, but Brian, was that the first job you had or no? So uh, I, I'll give you a quick background of myself. Um, so, see, I'm from I'm from Los Angeles, California, 
Okay. Uh, and the my background one. is in is in traditional art, drawing, painting, um, and so I really didn't have any exposure to, I, I would say, you know, animation, visual effects, uh, any type of CGI or, or uh, you know, working with a computer ever. Really, it was just just traditional drawing, um, and when I got out of college, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do with that. Um, I, I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to go to film school. Uh, I applied to, you know, the film schools that you hear about, UCLA, USC, uh, in these sort of world-renowned programs, uh, did not get into either of those. Um, so I found myself sitting there and kind of going, well, what am I going to do? I, I, I like art. Um, you know, and I see what's going on with visual effects, um, but I don't really know kind of how to what to do with it because the opportunities to go to an established film school really weren't there. Um, I, I guess, you know, I wasn't good enough or someone didn't believe I was good enough. So, um, you, then, get that, uh, you get that a lot in Hollywood. That's yeah. Well, I mean, you get that a lot your whole life, right? People will always yeah. question what yeah. you can do and, and will not believe in you. Um, and so you just got to believe in yourself and you got to kind of, uh, you know, find those opportunities and put your head down and, 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 you know, take the jump like Brad did, right? Um, so in Hollywood, very close to where Pacific Title Digital was, uh, there was a school that had just started up called GNOMON, G-N-O-M-O-N, School of Visual Effects. Uh, it's li literally across the street from Pac Title. Um, and I took, I enrolled in a class there, uh, an intro to, intro to 3D, intro to Maya class. And um, it was a 10 week class and I struggled probably eight of that weeks. Um, and by the end of the, the last couple of weeks, I was able to finally sort of model something and light something and, and you know, do a turntable and, and put some cameras in. And so that was a that opportunity you know, to, to learn that software and to, to learn the, the process of making a 3D uh, model was 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 great for me. Um, and it led to then taking more classes and taking more classes. And so finally, when that program, I'll answer your question in a long way, Brad, but when that program wrapped up, um, some of the people that were in that program um, were, some of them were industry professionals that had come back to school to learn, uh, that were more traditional, uh, you know, and worked in traditional film industry or some were students like myself. Um, there were some opportunities around to, to go, go, you know, work in, in production. So um, they got those. I was lucky also that, uh, the company that made Maya at the time, it's, I believe, owned by Autodesk now, but uh, it was called Alias Wayfront at the time. Um, they were hiring people to to do tech support for, for industry professionals. So uh, I essentially started working tech support. And so I, I would I would get these, uh, you know, I, I, basically West Coast clients. We would talk to, you know, Disney and DreamWorks and, and uh, Sony. Sony, Cinecide, all these, all these visual effects companies that for one reason or another, you know, they're, they're, you know, you've all had a, a if, if you, if you've worked in 3D or worked in a 3D app or, or a game app or UE or anything, there's times where something doesn't work, right? So uh, <laughs> that, that's the nature of software, right? So they would, they would go onto a tech line and, and enter their information in and upload their files. And I would just pull that stuff out of a queue. And so I, so I started, you know, breaking down their, their problems and looking at them, talking to people, you know, through their what, what problems they were having, right? So that that was how I got started working in in the industry, and I realized you know, quickly that that uh, the production job was the job I wanted, right? So so I I one thing led to another, and I was I found myself at, at Pacific Title Digital uh, working on a lot of films in a short period of time. Um, yeah, and and my first at Pack Title. I mean, when we, when I got there, when, when I met Brad, they we had an actual 3D department and we had uh, a 3D room and and it was looked like a normal like setup that you would expect to see in a production house. When I first got there, uh, they had a closet that was a like that they had a bunch of servers in and it was yeah. um, it was a very very uh, I mean you would he, he basically had a red sleeper on his desk. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was a closet. It, 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 it was a, it was a, it was a, I mean, my first desk there was a printer stand. Um, <laughs> I had, I had one monitor, um, which, you know, no one has one monitor anymore when you're working visual effects. Uh, part of the monitor had 
a, an area that didn't look right. It had a sort of a pink hue on it. So I had to put my render window <laughs> in the upper right corner. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was, it this was, is, a, this a, was CRTs. This is not, yeah, these are, yeah, yeah. It, it was, I mean, this is a long old time school ago, tube. Yeah. Um, we started out very humbly, uh, uh, you know, and, and I, I really enjoyed throwing that monitor away, uh, you know, <laughs> a year later. Um, but uh, that, that's where we kind of started. Uh, that's where I met Brad. Yeah. And, and, it, and I think what we should do is I, I let me, um, let me go back a little bit and tell everybody, um, I, you know, from that time of meeting Brian and me and him working together, uh, I went on to um, to become a compositor and then, f you know, from Roto and Paint work, um, I worked as a compositor on, and my first film was uh, uh, Jackie Chan's Tuxedo. And then, you know, went on to work on Pirates of the Caribbean, all three, pir pir first three Pirates of the Caribbean movies, all three Matrix movies. Brian, we worked on that together. Mm -hmm. um, and Spider-Man, and then it went on and on and on. And then through the years, I've moved up through the ranks. i become a visual effects supervisor on set and in-house. I ran one company in uh, L.A. for six years called Look Effects. I run their 2D department. Um, and during that time, I was nominated for a BAFTA for my work on Black Swan, supervision of Black Swan, and lost the final season. And uh, from then on, I you know things started to... Uh, uh, changing in the way we work as the globalization kind of working form, you know. Um, and so I saw the opportunity with technology to come out to the East Coast and uh, and start working out here uh, because it was coming in this direction. Um, I'm I'm condensing all this because I don't want to spend a lot of time on on uh, and people can you can ask me if you got questions about how I got here and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, been out here in in Georgia for the past. Uh, uh, four and a half years now, I came out here to work on, I was a supervisor for Walking Dead on season eight. And then uh, now I've taken a position um, as the head of studio for Fuse FX Atlanta. Uh, we've been, I've been in this job for since January 1st, but you know, um, we have uh, a lot of feature films. And uh, in during all this time of those years, me and Brian have been really close and, and really good friends and we've stayed in touch. He lives in, Seattle. I live in Georgia, and the other's opposite side of the country. And um, and uh, you know, I'll let Brian tell you just exactly where he came, where you know how we, when we met, and then where he went to. Yeah. So, so like we started uh, Pack Title together. Um, I was there for a few years. I worked on a lot of films with Brad, uh, and then um, I moved to a company called um, Rhythm and Hughes, which is. Uh, they won a couple of Academy Awards, uh, a very good visual effects company. They, they don't really exist in the same form they used to exist, um, but did a lot of talking animal movies there, uh, you know, Scooby-Doo, Garfield, um, uh, Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. Um, was there for a number of years. And uh, the thing about visual effects is is sometimes you're, you know, you work on a project for these sort of like, you know, at the end of it, you come in. Well, I, I was doing primarily uh you know, lighting and, and uh, lighting CG objects into live action plates. And so you come in kind of right at the end as a lighter and uh, you work in these sort of sprints, you know, three months, four months, something like that. And so there was this sort of want to kind of work on the pro a project for a, a longer period of time. And so I, I, I started talking to uh, a friend I had in common who was up at Microsoft working on some video games. Um, and so we chatted and, and they didn't really have specialization in the same way film had specialization of roles at the time. Um, they had more generalist, you know, maybe distinct distinction between character work and environment work, but, but not necessarily the specialization across, you know, lighting, visual effects, etc. cetera. Um, and so I had the opportunity to come up to, to work at Microsoft and, and work on some Xbox games um, uh, as a lighter. And so I, I did that and it was a really great experience and, and, the, the notion of working on a, a project, some some sort of beginning and over a two year cycle, seeing all the different phases of game development um, was was pretty interesting to me, um, and it, it was it was a different experience that I had working in, in visual effects where um, a lot of there's a lot of shift between a lot of you know uh, people come in they work on a project and then they leave uh, there's sort of this nomadic quality to it at times um, so. 
the game development aspect at that time, uh, it was an embedded team. And so it was, it was, you know, it was a team of like a hundred people at the time uh, working on the game together. Um, that then, uh, you know, a after that project was over, um, um, Bungie and Microsoft started having this sort of uh, thing where they were kind of, this is like kind of the end of Halo 3, um, fall of reach time period, um, Bungie and, and Microsoft started to part ways. And so Microsoft decided to build an internal team to take care of the uh, Halo franchise. And so I was I had the opportunity to start uh, be a part of that team. And um, as Bungie went off to make Destiny and, and work with Activision, um, we were we were left to take uh, that engine and, and and start to look at it and start to figure out you know how we were going to make uh you know the next the next halo games um and because film and filmmaking and storytelling was always sort of this thing that i i aspired to do as i mentioned um i, I started to take apart the, the the cinematic tool set and really look at that and um eventually uh that was what i i, I started doing just completely I sort of left the, the lighting focus to somebody else and I really just dug into how are we gonna uh, use a real-time engine to tell stories and, and make uh, you know, cameras and edits and, and, and character animation and whatnot. And so um, at the time they, they were convinced they were gonna hire uh, a director that was accomplished and, and had done lots of, of things. And, and so that, uh, that, that push Kept, but they could they could never quite figure out a contract, and they could never figure out a time, and they could never figure out. So these things went back and forth for a while. We and as game development frequently happens, um, you start to run out of time, and so they needed someone to go shoot a, a performance capture test, and so um, I basically got to do that. So they sent me to LA. Uh, they sent me to a, a, a place called Giant Studios. Um, which became Profile Studios, which then was actually purchased by um, Epic, uh, and they are part of the uh, the Unreal uh, Epic Lab now in, in Los Angeles. They've sort of been acquired. Um, but what they did before that as Giant Studios is they were the part of the arm of, of Jim Cameron's company, Lights from Entertainment, and did all the Avatar films and, and was responsible for all the, uh, the virtual production and, and performance capture and facial work there and so I got to work with that team which was in, in, incredible um, because they knew what they were doing and I really didn't um, I knew I understood uh, the cinematic aspect of it but I didn't really know much about uh, performance capture um, and so anyway I got I got the opportunity to work with that team and and do this test and um, I had a great uh, teacher uh, Bryce Cochran uh, who um, had a lot of experience in animation and, and uh, game development, and he, and he was instrumental in sort of um, helping me learn a great deal about performance capture and, and working on set. And uh, uh, anyway, they liked the, the the test, and you know they let me stay essentially. And uh, you know then I got to do I got to direct all the cinematics for Halo Four, all the cinematics for Halo Five, and then um, recently left. Uh, Halo to uh, to be an independent director, and so that's that's that brings me up sort of where I am today. Yeah, and I, I'd I'd like everybody to know that uh, you know I know we're uh, most of you are probably into the game development side of things, uh, and want to let you know that yeah we're we're getting into that and where we are using Unreal and how we use Unreal. Uh, Brian has a lot more uh, probably uh, I guess you have a little more experience than I do with using Unreal in production as. Well, so I'll say um, when we were when we were early on in, in Halo days, you know, um, we as we were developing, you know, we used Halo uses a proprietary engine. Okay, um, you know, there's lots of games made out there today. Lots of them use Unreal. Lots of them use uh, Unity. Unity, uh, and then there's sort of a, a whole group of them that that also use proprietary systems. And some they're, they're meaning that that they're they're built internally by by a dev team, um, and they have a lot of similar features. They just all kind of look different and do things a little differently. And some have, you know, are stronger at making certain kind of games. Some are stronger at making other kind of games. Um, and so we looked at uh, a lot of what 
Unreal does, you know, over the over the years, um, and and it's a fantastic, uh, you know, it's a fantastic game engine. Um, so, I think that what what's interesting about Unreal for me, um, especially recently, um, I had the opportunity um, be, because of uh, the relationship I had with Profile, which was Giant Profile, and then um, now the, the, they're part of Epic. Um, I was able to. Uh, get on the set of the Mandalorian for a day and, and do some observation. Um, and that, that was really a fascinating, um, experience watching how, how that stuff all worked and, and the relationship between the virtual production aspect, uh, the video walls, uh, the use of unreal, the use of, um, you know, bringing in those virtual sets, um, the camera tracking. Um, and, and I would, if, if anyone's interested in that kind of stuff, I would really encourage you to, to get online and, and 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 research that stuff, there's a lot of good videos out there that kind of show that process. Also, um, you can get into you know Unreal that they have they have full setups for virtual production, and, and you can really look at those that tool set and virtual scouting. And yeah. um, there's a lot of information there. Uh, way way too much for me to or Brad to even go through in a you know. Yeah, I'd say that that's true. I mean, um, another thing what me and Brian are going to do here in just a minute, uh, we'll get to it, is we'll show some demo reels of our of our work that I have done and Brian from what he's done on Halo and I, I right? Correct. And then correct, Brian. Halo? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then um, also uh, I, I want to just say that you know, um, getting into the Unreal side of things here, uh, kind of segueing into that, is like like Brian said, you know, Unreal, two years ago when I did this keynote with Patrick and, and these guys, I said, and I told everybody, and I think we can go back to that at some point, and you can look at the video, I said that Unreal was going to be used extensively in film production, and I highly suggested that everyone learn or at least try to look into it, you know, because... Um, you know, um, I four years ago when Epic kind of started in introducing the tool set to do, you know, this virtual product or virtual set, right? Um, I created for Librarians TV show with Dean Devlin. Um, I actually created. Uh, we tried it out uh, to see how that would work. A virtual set. Um, I don't. Ha I wish I if I'd thought about it, I'd show it. But we created this. Uh, this. Um, uh, for the first time, uh, I'm only time, honestly, uh, in four years, we, we come up with, we had this one scene where we had to have this particle generator that was gigantic. It took up like an, a, a stadium. It was huge. And so we put up a big green screen and in real time, we created this, this, uh, this particle accelerator and, uh, and, um, had the, you know, people being sucked into it and everything, but it was, it was all in unreal engine. It looked fantastic. It worked really well, except for there were so many bugs in it that we actually had to pre-render it and then composite it in. But it was a it was a good test bed to see what we could do, and the potential for it was so incredible that um, I started talking to Epic, although I, I didn't get very much feedback from them, you know, because I think you know I just wasn't in the right time or at the right position at the right place at the right time. Uh, but you know, uh, they kept they went on to develop. Uh, their tool set and now it is what it is um, you know we are in a time right now where Unreal is for the past year now we have been discussing on I've been talking to 20th Century Fox um, which is now Disney uh, and Paramount Pictures, Sony uh, all kinds of different productions um, that are coming up um, that all one that all saw the Mandalorian and said oh my god we want to do this well yeah, Mandalorian was a test bed basically for that, and it's really, really worked well for them. But people don't understand that also they had to redo about 80 percent of that work. Um, but it does work and it is becoming a, a kind of a norm um, in the industry, in the film industry. Uh, so it, it's pretty cool to see that the film industry and the game industry are pretty much coming into you know, working together as opposed to working opposites because the game industry, and I think Brian can tell me, tell everybody this too, the game industry and the film industry still think that they are separate entities and that they do everything differently uh, when it's not really true in, in a matter of speaking. They spend about the same amount of money. They spend $40 million and they, they create things the same way we do. 
Um, yeah, it, I think that, the, you know, it, there, there. I think there's a, there is a, I, there's a conception that they do things differently, and I think that that sometimes that is true. I think that the film industry, by and large, is, you know, it's, it's obviously much older in terms of it's more mature. It's uh, they have production uh, um, figured out in a very uh, methodical way, um, and 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 have a process to it where game development. Um, is a little more, uh, I don't know. It takes two or three years to make it. It's a little more run and gun it sometimes, right? Like it's the idea of, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, it's the idea of like, if you were going to um, be in a, a, a race uh, and you were building the car, you know, while you're doing, you know, if it's a hundred lap race and, and you're, you start building the car, but you're starting the race at the same time. But that that's a lot of the game industry is, is that you're constantly doing something, um, with the technical side of things that are impacting your ability to create content. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, you know, using a, using a product like uh, UE though, Unreal is, is mitigates quite a bit of that, right? Because you have oh. an engine that is, uh, you know, battle tested and, and um, yeah, is something that's off the shelf as opposed to, uh, you know, a custom made engine. Um, yeah. Where, the, the uh, proprietary stuff that they like to do. Yes. Which, I mean, you know, in the film industry, we used to, in the beginning, in the first years of the of film industry, when we were in it, we yeah. were writing proprietary code for a lot of things we were doing. And, and that's, and still, then, true. that's still true. Yeah. And, and, and the software was a hundred thousand or a million dollars in some cases for flame and flare and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but now we're, we're getting to more of a, a, an off the shelf. I mean, I don't think Nuke is, I mean, I guess you could consider Nuke and 3D Studio Max and, and Maya off the shelf kind of, cause you can just buy it, you know, for five, 10 grand or whatever, if you got that kind of money laying around. But, um, well, it's also, I think worth noting, um, a lot of the, and again, I, I don't know the audience that's out there right now listening, but, um, you know, most of these packages we're mentioning here, like they have educational licenses, they have yeah, student yeah, licenses exactly. and uh, Unreal does. And, and I know Maya does and all the Autodesk products and, and Photoshop and all that. Like, so, you know, I encourage anybody out there that's interested in this kind of stuff, go on these, uh, you know, yeah, sites and 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 get yourself a uh, a copy of uh, those kind of uh, student student licenses. Learning yeah, those. exactly. One of the questions that was asked actually ties into what you are saying here, uh, Brian. You were mentioning the fact that um, Bungie was using their own proprietary engine for Halo. Yep. And someone asked, does that also translate to film? Like in, in certain film. Are we using off the shelf engine, so to speak, or does some film decide to also use their own proprietary tools? Oh, I see that. Okay. I mean, yes, right. Uh, the, absolutely. But um, most of the larger, larger companies always have proprietary tools, and especially the ones that have been around for a long time, the ILMs of the world, like they have tons of proprietary tools they developed over the years. Um, yeah. And then and I can say that we at Fuse Effects we have about twelve uh, coders that that are writing some proprietary stuff for us even today. Yeah, it's 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 especially true of larger productions, but but even there there are always uh, you know VFX problems out there that people are looking to solve that that it's not a you know there's not a button to actually do or game or game development and game development as well for sure for sure. So you have you have lots of uh, you know, engineers that support the ability to create uh, what ends up going into the final uh, visuals or final uh, game. Well, yeah. as a as a DVD, you know, nerd and watching all the behind the scenes, I remember watching like Lord of the Rings, like Peter Jackson had them develop the, you know, the color timing and stuff like that. Typically, when someone develops that in-house, do they eventually sell it commercially so this can use it? Because that's not quite how game engines would work, right? Bungie is not trying to let other people use their platform, but does that happen in the film side? Um, yeah, it does. I mean, there are there are instances of where plugins and that kind of thing are proprietary things that, that are in studios. I mean, really, honestly, Nuke was proprietary to Digital Domain, and then Digital Domain decided to make that a, uh, a, a set of uh, off-the-shelf software, basically. And uh, the foundry, you know, bought it out from digital domain and made it, you know, basically something you could buy uh, freely or, or not freely, but, you know, you could buy by ordering it for, you know, the five or ten thousand dollars. But they all like Brian said, they also have the free uh, version, educational versions that you can use. Uh, they're pretty much fully functional. They just, you know, they're just limited 
to the uh, res, basically. Yeah, I, I think that that's when a when a studio invests uh, large amounts of of money in developing uh, millions, systems, millions it, sometimes. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, right. It depends, I think, on what that that piece of uh, code or, or tool actually does. Right. There are there are things that I think people freely share, um, um, and then there are things that I think that if it gives them a strategic advantage within that their market, they they guard that stuff pretty tight. So I think it just depends on, on yeah. what it is. Um, but I mean, you know, I mean, anybody that's in the industry for whatever time, we've all learned how to write and tickle, or we wrote in, um, in mail scripting, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's, if you can write code and you can write your own, pro, your own, your own, um, plugins that help the process a little bit then you know um, that it stays proprietary usually with the company um that you're working for um and that that's something to keep in mind too is like when you're working for a company if you're going to write anything code wise it usually becomes their property and it's not yours that is usually true <laughs> in, in pretty much all the cases um anyway i i'm what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to just, I think it's a good time to just show yeah. demo reel of what I've done. Um, uh, well, what fuse effects has done. Um, I'm pretty much still a virgin at this company. Haven't done anything. Um, so I think I'm going to bring up my, my, uh, demo reel from the company. All right, guys. So this is basically just a small show reel. <clears throat> we have about 10 or 12, but I'm going to show you the main reel of some of the work that we've done. And this is a combination of just 3D, 2D. And there is in probably instances of, of using you know, maybe a virtual set, but it's so new and it's so early on that, that you're not really gonna see Unreal stuff in this reel. That's probably gonna be next year. Um, but anyway, just enjoy it. And then when you got Q&A, And there you go. Very nice. I have a question for you, Brad, yeah. about that. Um, you mentioned you were you started off at least early on as being a rotoscoper. Has had there been breakthroughs in that? 
I, I did some rotoscoping at one point. Now I didn't have green screens or anything, but I painstakingly took every single frame and had to meticulously yeah. cut people out. Are we still there? Is it that, is it still that manual or have there been advances in that so that you don't spend four weeks trying to rotoscope a five second clip? Mm. Um, yeah, we still do that. And the advances are we send it to India. <laughs> okay. Okay. I do. I'm not kidding. We just sent it to India and uh, there's teams there. Of, and they're still uh, painstakingly doing it themselves. Frame by frame, there are software wow. now that will that will actually do a motion tracking. But I mean, for the most part, it's still it's still hand it's still by hand. Um, there's just usually too much information for algorithms to actually figure out how to separate you know you from the background or or whatever it may be. Um, but most of that work goes straight to India or you know even South Korea. I didn't know if maybe the algorithm can do a pass, kind of give you uh, masks. And then the person can go in there and just tweak them just to help well, out somewhat. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's all this depth filled, you know, algorithms that you could separate everything. But I mean, it's really honestly, it's there's just too much luminous values and those other kinds of things to just get it perfectly, you know, perfect. I mean, there are cases of where they really, really do well, but it's it's got to be an absolute perfect separation uh you know like your white on your shirt is going to get confused with the white in the background even though it's a tint tint of yellow but still it's white you know so sure you know the white on the left side of your shoulder on the very bottom of the floor has got a more of a bluish tint to it so it's going to pick all that up and it's just going to get confused so i mean it's still a manual operation but it's just done you know with uh sweatshops in india there was a question earlier about um they were asking, is it because of the game industry kind of eclipsing the film industry, why the why the film industry takes the game tools more seriously? And I, and I was going to say, was well, it the fact that now the game engines can be camera ready? Like back in the day, you weren't going to put graphics that Maniac Mansion would do in a in an engine. Um, but clearly now, yeah. stuff you're going to be seeing Whoa. in Halo 4, Halo 5, that looks pretty camera ready compared to what you see on The Walking Dead. Um, well, I mean... The thing with Unreal Engine is it's got to a point where technology also can support the the engines, you know? I mean, that's that's the key. Is like NVIDIA um, with their development, and then even Radeon, uh, you know, AMD. I mean, it's just really, it was the limitations of can the software keep up with the hardware and vice versa. And it's got to the point now that, yeah, I mean, I, you know, just from my, and we'll get to Brian's reel here in a minute, um, but, you know, a lot of what you saw now in my demo reel or the demo reel for Fuse FX, um, and and let me just I want to make sure something really clear that Fuse that that demo reel from Fuse FX is we have seven studios around the globe right now with more uh soon, but uh, you know, the, the guys in in Montreal, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, Los Angeles, New York, Atlanta, and Bogota, Colombia all did that work and um. And I just want to say that, you know, I mean, it's not just one 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 group of people. It's a host of 600 people. So one of the other things I want to say is like um, the work that we that you some of those some of the shots in there, especially like with the green screen shots, I mean, are getting to the point where we can do. And that's what we are doing actually now is is doing virtual sets that are camera ready and ready to go like the Mandalorian. Uh, Mandalorian is pretty simple. I mean, you know, because you're creating mainly some very basic kind of sets, you know, um, things that are, you know, a desert. I mean, that's pretty freaking simple to do. And then, you know, you maybe just some, um, you know, um, uh, set extensions, which are just kind of just a basic kind of concrete textures and stuff. I mean, you know, you haven't seen anything that's really busy and a lot of things going on. So, but we're getting to that. And I think with some of the future films that I'm going to be working on next year, um, which I wish I could really tell you about, but I think that you're going to see that we're going to do real time, real time uh, visual effects uh, that are just basically in real time. We'll create we'll create them two to three months ahead of time, and then um, we'll get to the set. We'll have the LED walls or the green screen because you can do this two two ways. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the limitations of Unreal in the film industry. At some point, once I, once Brian shows his stuff, um, so Pat, yeah. Pat, oh, I was just gonna say, uh, your question was was around um, 
you know, I think it, it sort of speaks to, and Brad mentioned with the sort of the render hardware car, hardware rendering cards, is that, um, you know, basically what the real time engine has allowed in, in some ways is to, you know, compress the rendering aspect of visual effects, right? And rendering time is, is something that was early on. Sure. Takes, take, it's really time consuming, right? And, and um, to the point where you have to calculate like how that, you know, how, how is that going to figure into the production of things, right? Like I can remember working on certain films where, um, you know, I would, I would make a little selection window of, of you know, oh fur creature to try to get the color and, uh, you know, the fur rendering kind of right. And, and, you know, I'm looking at the back plate and I'm looking at a square, a, a really abstract, like, you know, because that's all the time, that's all the process that could happen. I'm like, okay, I'm going to, you know, that's going to hour, I'm going to sit there and watch this thing go. I'm going to sort of take yeah. my back and I'm going to hit here, here and, and then I'm sending this thing overnight. And hopefully by the morning I come back and this thing's ready to look at it. I can make some more decisions, right? But with a with a real time engine, that stuff's like rendering yeah. that's constantly, right? So it's it's always there. I can always see that feedback loop, and so that has what. It, it, and to your also to your point, yes, some of the the the, the quality of the the real time graphics has yeah. has matched in many cases. Well, it is matched, right? I mean, like that's the stuff yeah. you see in, in Mandalorian. Those those are all real-time backgrounds right running out that's of that really brings up a good point because i mean me and you used to work in little windows that are 360 by 360 so we could just see we'd have enough time just to see what the texture and the lighting looked like and if it if there was anything blown out or screwed up yeah and if it was we'd have to sit there and we'd work on it and work on it and then make a china kind of adjustments and it would take you know an hour to render just a 360 you know by 360 square yeah yeah. And then, honestly, that was true. I mean, for uh, a lot of the tests I did for uh, Jim Carrey, you know, acting as the fish for, you know, that test we were doing uh, for uh, the Incredible Miss Olympia, um, we would literally do everything uh, for three or four days, setting everything up for three or four days. And then it would take anywhere from, I don't know, two days, sometimes two weeks to render to see what the results were and then you and if anything was fucked up then you were you were <laughs> you were you were even more time you know and take another two weeks so guess, yeah now it's like it's immediate and i think a lot of people are spoiled by that <laughs> i think i think uh then i think to tweak on that and kind of like go a little further uh people were saying you know the hardware is great too but uh i feel like film production and tv production they don't have the benefit the games do of hey i can put out a day one patch when when a movie's in theaters unless you're george lucas uh it doesn't get changed again or you know when it shows on tv it doesn't get changed again so um i think maybe from what i'm hearing from you all to some degree is the tools that are used to make games have finally come along so far that in the the maybe four year window you have to make that movie those products can help get it done otherwise back in the day you might have spent an entire week trying to ray trace one second of footage and it wasn't going to be realistic with the older tools to spend 20 years to make a movie because you got to get that sucker out now with unreal because you can do the real time stuff it helps fit better into your strategy of i got a target window when this has to come out and uh, the tools are finally fast enough to meet your needs yeah, I'd say that even for film production, I mean, you know, me and Brian used to work on stuff that would take probably sometimes we'd spend we'd spend two years on it, you know, sometimes, right, Brian? Um, a year to two years to make a movie, and now we're down to, I mean, I've worked on films that we shot and did and came out in probably six months, and feature films, you know, um, and now we're you know we're back to some spending a year, uh, and sometimes some are two years, but. That's really a, a producer kind of thing, you know. Uh, they see the film, it doesn't cut right, and then they then they go back and add more shots or whatever. But, you know, in, in essence, the hardware and software has come have come along so fast and so so quickly that, that even the video cards, you know, with Nvidia's chips doing so many teraflops, you know. Uh, and having petabytes of hardware, you know, of, of space to save everything to, uh, in real time that, yeah, I mean, it's got to the point where now we can, you know, I'd think, I say in the next five years, you're going to see a lot of jobs 
or positions eliminated, such as compositing, because you know things will be done in real time. Well, to, to, to piggyback off that, I think that that when you talk about something that's fully animated, that's not leveraging you know live action stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The ability to use a real time engine. I, I, I'm seeing. I have you know many many animation companies that I'm familiar with and talk to. You know are 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 looking at Unreal or moving through Unreal in ways because you can begin the pre-production process with an Unreal, you know, Unreal Engine and keep updating all the way through so that you're still working with that same core, like, scene and sequence at, at the end, right? It's not, you know, like, you may start with some thumbnail boards, but then you can quickly move into a, a pre-visualization um, and then just keep kind of swapping out assets that get you all the way sort of yeah. to the finish line eventually, right? And so... That speaks to a lot of how you know we made cinematics in the past, where you start with very rudimentary, you know, maybe it's just sliding characters, uh, previous characters, and these proxy backgrounds, and you position all that stuff and get that in, and then you're working very rapidly to develop your shots and your edit, um, and then once you kind of have something that's stood up and working, it's really a matter of replacing those those rudimentary and placeholder objects with final objects, final backgrounds, final animation, motion capture work. Um, and it's a lot of work in between, but you can start um, and finish with the same tool set, if you will. Yeah. I mean, I, the blocking itself anymore is not just blocking and it's got actual animation to it and everything, you know, I mean, as opposed to what it used to be. It's so much faster, you know, real time. Hey, Brian, I, I mean, I don't want to forget about showing your stuff, man. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, I was going to actually queue it up here for you. Uh, so I'm going to pull it up here. As I queue it up, uh, Brad, based off, based off of your role, there's a question here okay. I'll pop up that you can you can address <laughs> there while I pull up uh, Brian's. How does camera... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The way they... The way that... Like, for a virtual set... Thanks, Rob. That's cool, dude. Um, Rob's one of my best friends, by the way. He's we've known each other for a long time, just as long as actually longer than Brian. Um, so yeah, the um, the way they do that is they have um, a, Brian help me. What is the uh, the tracker on the cameras? It's the um, how does camera tracking work when compositing practical elements into virtual set? Oh, okay. Um, because we have a we have a tracker from uh, from yeah, uh, so HTC. It, so it knows. The, the lens information, the positional yeah. data of the camera as it relates to the virtual set so that when you move the camera, the, the background responds accordingly and it parallaxes correctly based on that lens information. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, that's I think that's what he's asking is like when we're tracking the camera X, Y, and Z, how does it know the virtual set? How does it know where the camera's at? And we have trackers that we put on there from Vive. I think it's the Vive software or hardware from HTC that we place on the cameras and they talk to each other. And I mean, yeah, I, and, but that leads to a lot of problems uh, for if you're going to use multiple cameras in, and you're shooting it like Mandalorian. Yeah. Uh, and I can get into that because there's keystoning effects that you got to worry about. And if you're shooting it like Mandalorian, but if you shoot it with a green screen, but then you're having a virtual set that's putting pipe through, then you can have multiple cameras. Uh, but but Rob, the 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 cameras themselves will have these uh, real time trackers on the cameras that feed into the system, uh, into the engine that that tell you it that basically you create the camera in in three D space, and then it knows exactly where you're moving, where you're yeah. focusing, um, it knows everything, and even to the like, point of knowing how to adjust the lighting in real time, all that. Like three yeah. D GPS. Basically, right. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. it's just it's positionally where it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me go ahead and pull yours up here, and uh, I've got your, I got the one, the the mocap uh, here. So let me go yeah, ahead and pop so it up. What, what we're going to look at right here is a, a behind the scenes sort of uh, edit of a of a sequence that I did with Digic Pictures um, out of Hungary. Uh, this is a collaboration. Uh, so there's there's a lot of work done by a lot of people other than just me. Tell me about the children. Dr. Halsey. You already know everything. 
you kidnap them. Children's minds are more easily accepting of indoctrination. Their bodies more adaptable to augmentation. The result was the ultimate soldier. And because of our success, when the Covenant invaded, we were ready. Dr. Halsey, you're bending history for your own favor, and you know it. You developed the Spartans to crush human rebellion, not to fight the government. When one human world after another fell, when my Spartans were all that stood between humanity and extinction, nobody was concerned about why they were originally built. So you feel in the end your choices were justified. My work saved the human race. Do you think the Spartans' lack of basic humanity helped? What are you after? The others before you were naval intelligence, but you... You're something else. Records show Spartans routinely exhibited mildly sociopathic tendencies. Difficulty with socialization. The records show efficient behavior operating in hazardous situations. I supplied the tools to maintain that efficiency. Do you believe Master Chief succeeded because he was, at his core, broken? What does John have to do with this? You want to replace him? The Master Chief is dead. His file reads, missing in action. Catherine. Spartans never die. Your mistake is seeing Spartans as military hardware. My Spartans are humanity's next step. Our destiny as a species. Do not underestimate them. But most of all, do not underestimate him. Damn. Cool. Good stuff, man. Um, that's amazing. So, so that was um, that's a pre-render piece. That's that's not in engine work, but uh, uh, basically, uh, as I said, that's a collaboration with Digic, um, and we. Uh, that, well, I'm sorry. Was that Halo Three, Four? That, that's you? Halo Four. Uh, yep. That was a prologue piece for Halo Four, and, and essentially um, for that. Uh, you know, our write, our writers wrote that internally, um, and we then uh, we cast those roles, and and uh, I went to Los Angeles to shoot those, uh, and uh, we did all the performance capture there, and then sent that to to Digic uh, with all the the animation data, um, and then I worked back and forth with them on the edit, and uh, also they did some of the edit internally. Um, and uh, we went work through all the assets, and they sent us for approvals and, and animation, and, and back and forth with cameras. And uh, that, that was a it was a real fun piece to do, um, and, and they did a fantastic job on it, uh, finishing it for us. And you were your role in that was director, correct? Yeah, so I, I was the director on the on the three four three side, and so basically I was there uh, working with the actors on set. Um, uh, Worked with the DP there to kind of if you can you can see sort of the the onset camera has a has a pretty similar feel to what we what they used for the for the the, the CG shoot um, rendering there so um, um, we worked on that together and uh, yeah do you know what software they uh, they were using was that Maya or what um, I'm going to assume that that the animation was done in Maya I don't know for a fact but that's my 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 guess um but now but now you it would probably be more in engine like unreal well so i think that the character work would still be done in maya um that would be mm. you know that's 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 how we did it internally we did all of our character work so we, we made you know this is done pre-render but but we've done you know for halo 4 and 5 we did like 120 minutes of of real-time stuff right so right right um we would we would shoot the same stuff the same way uh that data would come back to us um it would be put into maya scene files 
we would have the ability to take assets out of the game engine and export them, uh, bring them into Maya so that we can make sure positionally the environments all all worked. And then that stuff was then all exported back into the engine. Cool. Yeah. I mean, what's the difference now between, I mean, is there any difference now between um, what you guys are doing or what you would do as opposed to what you had been doing? So I, I think that um, what I'm seeing and from talking to people, I think that there's a, the tool set inside of, of Unreal um, that allows you to kind of let the edit live in Unreal um, uh, is, is pretty powerful and that, that the camera work, if you, if you need to do custom camera work, you can do that in animation package and then bring that into Unreal. Um, but having that, that sort of living edit um, working in Unreal in the engine so that you can explore, if you want to shoot something from a different angle or, or say, you know, I want to add a shot here, we can do this. Um, that stuff can all be done in the engine. So early on, I mean, you wouldn't do that when you're getting to the end of a project, but early on, you know, you have the ability to very to be very nimble and, and modify things on the fly um, so that you can get to that that ideal kind of edit and, st and, and storytelling aspect of things. Yeah, and I think that's the way Unreal is, you know, it's pretty amazing how how game development is actually, it's kind of coming into the film industry. And, and 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 helping us do that kind of thing in real time as opposed to taking um you know uh, having to build sets which takes months and months and months sometimes and well, i things, mean yeah well i was gonna say the things i've seen with a, a lot of and and we do this on games right is that with you start typically in a game uh you're building a very rudimentary uh game level right and so yeah. it's you know, gray boxes and it's 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 just the shape and the form of things right and so you can then go either via you know the game game camera or with a with a you know headset or whatever you can sort of virtually scout oh we want to shoot this we want to shoot that and that's what's being unreal is being used for um in many virtual productions yeah 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 that rudimentary very low fidelity kind of soft game uh you know level in yeah. Look at everything, figure out what you want to shoot, and then spend the time to up res and go high detail on those areas that, that you've pre-selected, as opposed to building everything yeah. and then shoot and then figuring it out, right? So you can be targeted and efficient in where you where you sort of deploy that labor. Yeah. Um I think the uh, you know for for gaming side of things you know having an unreal engine is really i mean it really helps you guys develop the game a little quicker and having a, a bigger tool set to make it more film like right and, yeah. and 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 it's and it really works great for film i mean for for uh for game development but in film uh there's some there's some so there's some quirks in the, the in the in doing and using it in the film industry, there's a little bit of, of, of problems and quirks that, that that you know when you're creating virtual sets. And one of the one of the problems that we have using Unreal is if you're going to do something in the style of Mandalorian, um, you can only use one camera, mm -hmm. you know, because you have a keystoning effect, and that camera has to look in that one direction the whole time to make sure that all the perspective is right and everything is perfect. And if you're looking off of that, and if you if anybody has seen the making of it. If you look on off of that, you can see that there's there's just nothing else happening. It's just a static image. Um, the other, but the only other way to use multiple cameras is you make the walls green. You have just your set pieces there, like a bathtub and or you know the sink and the mirror lights are up here to light people, um, and then the green walls and a green floor. Um, so you're not really building the set. And then through two cameras, you know you got the ability to use two cameras because those cameras are just looking in space in the, in the unreal engine in those, those positions of where those cameras are. And you don't have to worry about the keystoning because the rendering is coming through the cameras and to the monitors as opposed to an led wall. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you it's know, just unreal approach, right? like it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. Like what, what the, what the, you know, what's the solution you want for that specific shot or for that specific sequence, yeah. right? Like one may yeah. have more advantageous. It may be more advantageous to have multiple cameras because you can work quicker for some reason, or yeah. it may be more advantageous for a certain, uh, to have a single camera. It depends on kind yeah. of the, the film. 
I mean, that's one of the things we're trying to deal with in, 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 in um, like I've worked, I've just finished working on Black Lightning uh, for the first, for two weeks of shooting. And I mean, if you know, like if we wanted to use virtual sets, I mean, it, it comes down, even Walking Dead or any show that I'm working on, um, you know, it comes down to a new thinking of and planning that we have to create these sets four or five, six weeks before we ever get into production. At least, so, right? That, that, yeah. That's the thing is, is, is the is thinking about things? You sort of flip the model, right? Yeah, Where, exactly. Whereas a lot of the the post production is called post production because it's done at the end, right? Yeah, the yeah. Pre production function, right? Where yeah. you're building yeah. those those sets ahead of time, planning yeah. those sequences ahead of time, and then that's kind of the decisions are made up front as opposed to making those decisions later. Yeah. And, and really honestly, the film industry used to be that way in the old days because it just took a lot of planning to get all that done. Uh, when we were shooting on film and everything like that, because everything ha you just don't have infinite amounts of film and infinite amounts of time. Now they want to compress everything. We got digital, we can just keep rolling and we can shoot and shoot and shoot. But also, you know, um, there's a, you know, it's, it, the film industry is run by a bunch of people who want to see the numbers all the time, you know, um, so everything has to be compressed. I mean, we shoot, you know, episodes in nine days, um, as opposed to when it probably would have taken, you know, way back, it probably would have taken a month to shoot an episode or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, if it, if it contained lots of visual, visual effects and every show now has visual effects in it, you know, almost every television show has some kind of visual effect in it. Um, uh, what was I getting to? But anyway, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> Patrick, are there any other questions out there from anybody? Yeah, has anybody got any questions? I mean, we can't see the questions, unfortunately, so we really don't. Uh... Uh, yeah, oh, we had a hi. <laughs> hi, Corey. Uh, Patrick, uh, you changed. Yes, uh, I think I believe Patrick is uh, with another stream right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> But uh, we have a question from Julie Terry. Uh, she is a professor at Mount West, and she would okay. like to know what are some basic skills and software students need to learn in community college and on their own as first steps if they want a career in visual effects? Oh, visual effects? Yes. Um, honestly, I think, I, think, I think visual effects and gaming industry, if you, regardless of what you want to do, the, there's, there's software that is used all across the, the two types of industries. Which is, you know, learn how to use Maya for, for one, if you want to do 3D. Compositing, learn how to use Nuke. Um, and even even to an extent, Resolve, uh, DaVinci Resolve. Um, the other software is like, you know, if you want to do textures and stuff, I guess Photoshop would be uh, another one to actually kind of get your, your fingers into. Um, uh, I mean, really, that, honestly, I mean, you know, there's some tracking software, yeah. <laughs> I, so if I, if someone who's just starting out right now today, yeah, uh, the, the, the three things I would say to know are Photoshop, Maya and unreal. Oh yeah, absolutely. Unreal. Yeah. yeah Those absolutely. are, unreal. so they're, yeah. especially the way the VFX industry is trending, knowing unreal and knowing how to use real time engines are, that is, that is something very valuable. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I would say that that learning uh, Nuke or some kind of compositing software it will very much help you in using Unreal when it comes down to lighting. For sure. The, and uh, the understanding the 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 fundamentals of compositing, right, are are yeah. are, are critical because that's the, what what an engine is doing is doing real time compositing, right? And yeah. So, exactly. Um, yeah. Understanding yeah. those fundamentals, but but absolutely, like there there's you know. Um, there's he's even uh, uh what's the Photoshop equivalent of <laughs> uh, After Corel. Effects, right? cool. um, yeah, After Effects or yeah. But but really kind of understanding a, a 3D package, a 2D package, whether it's whether it's Photoshop and and Brad is right about about compositing, understanding how that works, because um, that's how all the images are assembled, right? And understanding different yeah, layers. Pretty much, compositing. pretty much, compositing is the is the butt end of everything, and we're the last ones to touch those images to go out to film and then to to your TV or, or, you know, feature film. And I mean, you know, it's understanding getting compressed, it's getting compressed into unreal, right? Real oh, that's true. Real yeah, compositing. it is actually, I mean, cause compositing, I'd say, I would say in five to 10 years, depending on how the industry 
accepts Unreal Engine as a as a part of the tool set. I would say you've got five to ten years before compositing will be very minimal. It'll still yeah. be there, but because television productions just don't have that front end time, they don't have that time to do. They don't have four to six weeks to do the the pre production as opposed to the post production. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that compositing is still going to be there, but it's it but it it'll be a lot less. And you're still fundamentally, you know. Um, Trying to spit something out of you know a single image out of a, of a real time engine can be challenging at times, right? So there still will be compositing there. You'll still have maybe oh, yeah. a layer, a character layer, an effects layer, like so. There and, and then of course coloring. So there there are there still will be elements. It just instead of being you know two hundred compositing elements that you might see in a film plate, it, you you have you know a reduced number 10, 15, yeah. 20, You know, but yeah. the software, yeah, it's definitely there's. I mean, it's anything, I think really honestly, before you get into any of this industry, either one of them, you just got to learn and, <clears throat> and understand color lighting um, and, uh, and yeah, just the basics of color and lighting. If, if you want to be on the art side of things, yes, I think that there's a, you know, there's, there's many disciplines within, within the art world, right? Or, or art you know, an artist and art in like, general. Yeah. Yeah. Visual effects yeah. artist, right. There's, there's the color lighting side of thing. There's, you know, sculpting and, and, and the ability to model things, um, is, is, is critical also if you want to do, uh, you know, I, I think that I think overall for me anyway, after being in this uh, film in this industry, and I did work for Activision for a little bit too, uh, on the game side of just for about six months, but, um, I think that uh, having a wide range of understanding of of the software allows you to, like me, I started out in 3D. I was doing facial motion capture, research and development, which took me into 3D world, creating 3D heads, textures, and that kind of thing. And then once that fell through, I decided that, you know what, I knew how to composite by using After Effects back in the day and Shake. Um, and, uh, I, I just went into that and I was lucky because the other guys that were with me, Brian, you know, this, the other guys that were with me in that R and D side of things were out of jobs for about two or three months, mm -hmm. you know, because they didn't have the knowledge in, of other software. And mm -hmm. I did, you know, and so I think that really helps if you get into this industry, you learn all the software that you can possibly and, and it doesn't necessarily need you. I don't necessarily mean you need to take more classes because a lot of this stuff is available out there online, uh, tutorials and stuff for compositing software like Nuke, uh, DaVinci Resolve, um, and those kind of things. But you, but know. you need to learn the fundamentals, right? Because without yeah, the absolutely, yeah, yeah. You, you won't be able to follow along on a, on a tutorial, right? So, so oh, yeah, absolutely. Understanding the fundamentals of, of how images are assembled and how uh you know modeling yeah. tools work or how any of that stuff work i think is yeah is yeah exactly pseudo. exactly and picking brains of people like this any other questions i mean patrick Corey? uh yes we have one more question uh from attack of the nerds this is actually gary bradford <laughs> <laughs> that happens to be my cousin <laughs> he's my student he's uh, yeah, yeah. he's an awesome dude um, his question is, has Brad used Quixel or Substance? And if so, what does he think of those tools? Um, yeah, I'm actually getting ready to, I, I know Quixel and, and I don't know, I don't know Substance. I don't know Substance yet, but Quixel, yes. Um, and yeah, I just started downloading some of those assets from Quixel to, to start doing some tests on virtual sets and stuff. But yeah, Quixel is freaking amazing. Brian? Um, I mean, I, I just, my, my experience with that stuff is limited, right? I'm aware of it, right? And yeah, I, yeah. I see the, the assets and the, the visuals that are available kind of, you know, for free for uh, Quixel. Yeah, I think Quixel, Quixel got bought out by Epic, so now all those, you don't have to really pay for that anymore. Well, as long as you have an Epic account, you can, and you're a, you know, yeah. Yeah. not-for-profit, you know, you, you can download that stuff and, and, and experiment with it, which is great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we we use Substance and uh, Quixel and Unreal Engine in uh, most of our game development classes. But I've in one of the classes is uh, like an entrepreneurship, and I'm gonna use that class as a guise to slip in a virtual production lesson, where mm -hmm. we do we use uh we have a bunch of Vive controllers that we'll use as virtual cameras and just get right, them right. at least introduced into it. But uh, 
but yeah, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, I think Patrick is going to come back in and uh, okay. take it over. But there is uh, Patrick. I was just, I was just actually trying to get on the stream, and I was going to send you a question, and you'd be like, "Well, how did Patrick send me a question?" But uh, <laughs> I, I didn't get, I didn't get far enough in. Uh, my question was going to be, <clears throat> out of curiosity, Brian. I know that there are super expensive rigs and stuff. Uh, that you all do for mocap and I'm just I'm wondering personally um, if I'm a person that wants to create my own game and I want to try to create some halfway decent cinematics I mean I'm, I'm a one-man band do you have suggestions or have you seen out there in the industry more um, poor man's ways or jerry-rigged ways like can I take a coat hanger and and wrap it around my shoulder and put a GoPro out here and put dots on my face. Are there any low tech solutions without spending a million dollars that I might be able to do to make a halfway decent mocap for my indie game? So I'm sure there are. I just, <laughs> I just, I just haven't done many of it. Right. So I, I see stuff all the time though, you know, on, on different feeds of people who are experimenting with, you know, um, tracking software and camera tracking, you know, I see people do stuff on phones and, and, and all that. So I'm sure there are, and there is the ability to do sort of a lo-fi way to, to handle this stuff, man. I just yeah. don't have a lot of experience with that stuff. Um, and, and to be honest, I rely a lot on the expertise of, um, you know, those around me to, to, because yeah. that, that's that was- filmmaking, Cinematics, game development, all that stuff is really, really, really a collaborative nature. And there are the one man shows and the one man st- you know, shops and all that. But um, I can't do those things by myself. I, I, I need yeah. to rely on, on others to and their expertise to to so that Yeah, I, I I'd say that we're probably a little spoiled now because we have access to millions of dollars. <laughs> I mean to be quite I'll be hundred percent honest. You know, I mean, if I need to do something, then I've got it. All I got to do is just ask for it. But I mean, I think honestly that um, uh, try anything. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, if you, yeah, what you said, I wouldn't use a coat hanger, but, you know, uh, but I would formulate some kind of, of system rig that you could do that. I mean, because there's all you need is the, the information, your face, facial animation, you know. Well, I think of that TV show, and this is a weird, obscure pull, but there was a TV show on MTV called Fear, and they would, like, pay people money to go to haunted places, and they had some sort of rig. And also, in the movie Requiem for a Dream, too, I feel like they had Marlon Wayans running down a hallway, and he had a rig on with an arm that came out that had the camera. So I know those are out there. Um, I mean, I know I could put a GoPro out there, but I'm – you know, as an as an indie guy who's not much in the field, I'm I would think, of course, I can film my face and I can film dots, but the software in between is going to help me. You know, well, do that free software out there. You know, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of what I'm seeing now is like there's it's less about dots anymore. You know, yeah. sometimes there is exactly. some tracking dots placed there so they can use as reference, but um, a lot of the newer stuff is processing just video feeds. Um, and and so, and to be honest, some of it also is is about you know, animation reference, right? Like you, you, you shoot just video and then it's about looking at that video as, as, as a form of reference. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, right. a, it's so emotion. Even, even stuff that's, you know, the stuff you saw here that's, that's gone through a solve and, and has been put on a rig. There is an animator that goes back and touches all that stuff, right? It's, it's not just, it doesn't just spit it out and it's done. It's, it, it has to be, you know, performance has to be, you know, developed. It's it's a real collaboration between the actor and the animator. Yeah, because I mean, anything that we've, I mean, anything that I've been involved in in developing as far as motion capture goes, there's a shit ton of noise that happens when you're capturing this stuff, and it's not just A to B. And then you have filters on there that filter that noise out, but that noise then creates unrealistic motion, motion and movement. So then you have to add a little bit of noise back. But I mean, the best results usually are. Uh, I don't want to say rotoscoping, but uh, uh, motion, I can't remember what they call it, but, you know, basically capturing your movements by just filming yourself and then putting that in there and then overlaying your, 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 your like model. Like kinetics, uh, kin- uh, kinesiology, but, 
that type of thing? Uh, sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, because well, I know, I feel like most animators would say, like, you know, my my best friend is having a mirror because you know half the time you yeah. see people doing stupid stuff to try to figure out how to do it. So I'm sure just having a camera on the person when they're delivering that, you can see that. Uh, I just didn't know if there was any, you know, home home style things because I even. I'm a bit like I say, I'm a big fan of all these behind the scenes stuff. And I remember somebody actually made an isotope that they would put on the person's face. So mm -hmm. forget the dots. It was like sort of isotope that they could fully capture their face. Maybe, maybe it was uh, Hideo Kojima in, in Death Stranding. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. I was just trying to think, yeah, that's, that's money up here. I don't mm -hmm. have, what yeah. can I do? Because suddenly the tools are in our graph. Suddenly we do have blender. Suddenly we do have unreal four, unreal five soon. I just thought on that that side of the fence, what are the possible open source stuff? And I get it. Yeah, you guys, like you say, Brad, you guys have the million dollar checkbook. So <laughs> I just thought maybe if, if you'd heard anything out there, I, I haven't. More, I haven't. Yeah. But but that's uh -huh. that's just me. But that, I know there's stuff out there that 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 can do uh, lo lo-fi face cap. No, yeah, right. there's there's a, a lot of that. There's a lot of that stuff out there. There is. Um, it's just a matter of finding something that actually. I mean, to be quite honest, I mean, you're just never going to get software that's going to capture 100% of the action that you don't need to go back and spend weeks or months or days on just, you know, cleaning it up. And to be quite honest, capturing something with that software typically wastes more time than if you just did it yourself. Yeah, I wanted to throw in that Epic actually just released a live link facial capture uh, app for iOS. So you just, they do sell, uh, they look like coat hangers, but they're commercial. <laughs> uh, you yeah. hang them in front of you and you look at the phone and it, it captures and it just sends it real time into Unreal Engine. Yeah, the most, exp most expensive go. coat hangers around. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. I just wanted to kind of plug that. Yeah, yeah, sweet. Yeah. yeah I mean, that, that's a, yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I would just ask gentlemen here kind of as a last open ended question for you all. Um, maybe, maybe Brad, you can be a soothsayer again, a prognosticator here as well and, and see where you say, where you see things going or even maybe, um, you talked about how, even though what we see the Mandalorian, everyone's like, this is revolutionary. They had to redo things. Maybe since you see the back end stuff, you know, you see the, um, uh, behind the curtain, maybe you have advice. If if we're trying to do this stuff ourselves, if we're trying to do that, what are what are tips? Where can we do things right that you've seen footage come in wrong? Maybe here as an end question. <clears throat> I mean, the thing about it is, is like uh, it's all experimental right now because it's so new. I mean, this is just like this is like Star Wars nineteen seventy six. You know, when they started developing everything, uh, the motion control cameras. Uh, you know how to do the, all this stuff you know, with uh, the garbage mats and, and, you know, all that. I mean, it's, it's also brand new that there is no answer to that really, honestly, at this point um, for the, for the film side of things, you know um, I mean, I'm literally, I mean, I've been talking about this for six, seven months now, and we're just now getting to the point of where we're actually going to be doing it on some shows, but it, that won't be happening until next year. Um, and right now we're just, we're in the midst of experimentation, testing and uh, seeing, you know, making our mistakes. So we, so we know what we can and cannot do. I mean, you know, even Mandalorian, I mean, Mandalorian, I think they worked on that for two years before they ever got it situated. And plus, you know, Mandalorian, I think those screens, I don't know, Brian, maybe, you know, I can't remember the number, but I think those screens cost upwards of two to three to four million dollars for the screens themselves. Um, I, yeah, I don't know specific numbers. I would imagine yeah. it's at least that. Um, That's, but yeah, that, yeah. I, I think you're right in terms of it is experimental. I think that, that Unreal Epic has some good ideas about best practices. And I think that obviously, you know, companies like ILM and, and, and the companies that are doing uh, these kinds of productions are, are coming up with a, a best practices and kind of what to, how to do things. Um, but but yeah. you're right. It, it will probably what they're doing right now today <clears throat> different a few years from now. Um, yeah. I, I think the only thing I would say about virtual production in general, VFX in general, game development in general is, is, is the amount of effort you put into preparation 
before you get to actually shoot something is really critical, right? And and that's planning and preparation is, is something that, that I found is is incredibly important for motion capture, for virtual production, for, for visual effects, setting any, any of the yeah. stuff that you can do beforehand, even if it feels like you're doing too much beforehand, you're probably not doing too much beforehand. Um, yeah, for sure. So that you, when you get to actual the, the aspect of shooting, whether it's whether it's a, a two person shoot or a, a hundred person shoot, that you are there, ready to do your job. Um, that that's that's kind of like, I don't know. That's that's one I live by. Try it anyway. Yeah, that's great advice to impart. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your expertise, uh, showing some of your all's footage and, and talking to our students. And even, you know, in the future, when it's posted, uh, future people who are going to be watching this. Uh, once again, I want to thank my presenters, Brad Kalinowski, who's the head of studio at Fuse FX, and Brian Goodrich. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks thank so you. Much. Take care. Bye. Right, have a good one. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>